We are live with the great Gavin Glacus. Gavin, you got to show us what you're going to do today. Hi, Eric. How are you? I'm, well, today, I'm great, man. Good. I'm glad. Well, today I'm going to take a color study that I did from life, and I'm going to bring it into the studio, and I'm going to put some details in based on the information that I got from life. Outstanding. Okay. Well, let's get right into it and uh, go ahead and get your camera set, and we will we'll do this. Uh, okay. Today is day number 338, and it's my very last day. I'm so sorry, but you know, you got you got a really great artist for the very, very last day. And when I say it's my very last day, let's hope it's not my last day on earth. But <laughs> what I mean by that is I'm going to take a vacation. I've been doing this for 338 days, and uh, I'm exhausted. So uh, I started noticing I was getting grumpy. I know that's hard to believe, but. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna leave here for uh, a week, maybe longer, maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks, maybe ten months. I don't know. And as soon as I feel like coming back, I'll be back. And then uh, uh, we're gonna have replays, the best of going on throughout the week at at noon. And of course, we will continue our 3 p.m. broadcast every day, seven days a week. So, Gavin, let's get let's get to it. Okay. So I went down to Georgetown in Washington D.C. the other day. Um, this is a little more ambitious than most of the color studies that I do. I do a lot of color studies from life and then I'll bring them into the studio and um, I'll paint studio landscapes, but I'll try to, um, I'll try to just bring as much information from life, not just color studies, but sketches, you know, I'll try to work out the perspective, the uh, depth and, um, but I love the creativity and the freedom of the studio. So would you like me to show your images where you started creating this? Uh, th I think that that might help. Yeah. Okay. So here's the reference image. This is where you from where you stood, and then uh, here is an image of you kind of you've kind of laid it in with a looks like a transparent red oxide, I and then kind of kind of got it to the point it is now. That's right. Um, I spent some time on the um, on the proportions. Um, you know, it's a little complicated with all of this architecture and the perspective. And then I just let her rip with the color and tried to really get a sense of all of the colors that were going to be present in the scene, not just in the house, but the sky and also um, the ground. Some of those colors that are a little tough to find from photos. So I want to point something out real quick. I want to point something out real quickly. I'm going to pull this photo back out. Now, look at uh, the, the photo on the left, um, the one with the bicycle in it. And look at the light on the building. Now, this is probably 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes later. Look at how much the light has changed. And so Gavin had to capture the light that he wants to portray. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this develops. Okay. Now, if you'll walk us through what you're doing, that'll be helpful. We have a lot of people watching who are not... Um, you know, not uh, up to speed on some of the latest things or may not have ever painted before? Well, I'm taking this very general sort of approximation that I started with. Um, I used the sketch to help me figure out um, proportions and also composition. I, I, I try to compartmentalize my problems. After working that out, I tried to just really discover the color that I was looking at. And... Um, I love kind of just experimenting with color. If something looks a little bit orange, you know, maybe it's going a little bit yellow. Maybe it's going a little bit red. How red is it going? Well, perhaps it's um, perhaps it's going so red as it's getting purple. Or perhaps it's going so yellow that it's getting green. So um, the beginning of my paintings, the beginning of my color studies are usually just an exploration into color and just sort of an examination of what, not necessarily what's there, but uh, more importantly, kind of what I can get away with. Um, so I find that just endlessly exciting. It's just kind of playing with color and pushing it. And when I'm doing color studies, a lot of times they're a lot quicker than this, you know, 20 minutes when the sun is setting, that type of thing. Um, it's kind of like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get as much information as I possibly can before I have to leave. And uh, I do them with commissioned portraits too. You know, if, if the person's really busy and they don't have time to sit for me, I'll see if they can give me, and nobody does, nobody has time to sit for me. Um, so I'll see if I can get an hour with them. 
Let me show real uh, quickly, uh, Gavin, let me show real quickly some uh, portraits that you've done so people get an understanding of that. First off, this is looks like Harry Reid. Uh, that's right. That's his Senate Majority Leader portrait. And you said that's hanging in the Capitol? That's right. All right. And then this is? Uh, that's Stephen Ayers, who was the 11th architect of the Capitol. He just retired recently. Wow, that's fabulous. I'll go ahead and show a couple of the, your other paintings, too, real quickly, so people can see some of your developed work. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. That really means a lot. Well, you're you're really an accomplished artist. Really, Thank do. you very much, Eric. Yeah, you're very good with drama and light. I love that. I grew up on the illustrators. Um, I grew up on, you know, my dad used to read the Iliad to us when we were kids, my brother and me. I love that. And uh, those are effects that I'm so fascinated with. And um, I'm so fascinated with uh, uh, just trying to explore those and push them as far as possible. So I really appreciate that. Now, you might, while you're dealing with that, you know, that's a tough subject to, to create something that, you, you first off, you've got perspective. Uh, you also have roundness, and you have to create that sense of roundness. Can you, can you address that while you're going through this? Yeah, I actually, that's one of the things that I find the most difficult is um, just really drawing. I mean, it's a drawing problem, not a painting problem, but um, just going after anything round, anything symmetrical, and... Um, doing it in a way that doesn't feel stilted or, um, or, or you know, too stiff. So uh, it always helps me to just put a line straight down the middle. Now, this tower is, uh, for me, a little more complicated because it doesn't actually curve all the way around on the right side. It kind of stops nine-tenths of the way around and hits this flat plane here. But it helps to figure out where the middle is, you know, whether you're drawing a glass of orange juice or a tower. Um, and then... You know, try to find an area that's equidistant while working out those ellipses. So that's not something that I really enjoy, but for some reason I feel compelled to do it. Where is your horizon line? So just so people understand the perspective, where where would your horizon line be? It's about here. It's a little difficult because this. Oh, let me just push, pull back a little. Oh, I can't. Um, yeah, we couldn't see all that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the this is a hill. So this is a hill. And then this is a steeper hill. The horizon line is, I didn't even, I usually put it in. I didn't even put it in on this one because it, it's below here. I want to say that it's about here. So everything above the horizon line is pointing down. Everything below the horizon line is pointing up. Yeah, and it's a little complicated because some of these areas that we, you know, didn't do think about as being below our eye level, like the bottoms of tires, are really above us. So, um uh, it took a little engineering, but I, I like that. I mean, I like I like going out and sketching. Like the so. challenge. Okay, mm -hmm. zoom it in really close, like you had it before, and uh, good. Yeah, good. I love these details. It's it's for me. It's a big part of the subtleties of those little areas. Uh, really help tell the story. So um, that's kind of what I'm excited to get into today. Outstanding. Well, we're glad to have you. Thank you. I will tell everybody real quickly, so I don't interrupt you later, that uh, we have prizes today. Uh, the winner of the plein air apron is Jan Hansen from Washington State. And today we're giving away a copy of, uh, not a copy, but a full year subscription to uh, Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine, the digital edition. And to, wait, to win that, just leave a comment and then we'll pick from the comments even after the replays. All right, you're back. Great. And part of this, when it comes to the details, is how much do I want? How far do I want to push those details? How much is going to help the cause? When does it start hurting the cause? Um, all those types of decisions. As, as we all know, at a certain point, you know, too much detail really just crushes the spirit of something. Um, so everything, I mean, color, value, everything, it's just a question of, is this going to help the cause? People are going to ask me what kind of brush you're using, what, what's the surface you're painting on, and what did you tone your canvas with? I love these brushes. These are um, 
uh, by Jack Richardson and company. They're called gray matter brushes and they're basically razor sharp. Um, I can create really sharp edges in here. I also use them for areas like foliage and places where um, I do want some scrappiness, but for me, it helps a lot to paint with angles. Um, and uh, this kind of prevents me from getting into amorphous curves, but rather, you know, to keep the, to, to keep making decisions um, by using angles. So I love these brushes. And the other uh, thing I like about them is that they, I think they were the first to come out with a painted ferrule so that it doesn't reflect in your eyes. <laughs> right. It's so helpful when you're outside painting in the sun. I even find it in, in the studio. The other night I was painting in the studio. My lights are right ahead of me, and I get this big blinding reflection off the ferrule of my brush. <laughs> right. Yeah, I just we just moved. I just put these lights in, and uh, I'm still getting to know my way around my studio. So, yeah, it's a great effect. I mean, if anybody who's ever worn a white T-shirt out in the sun while uh, painting a landscape knows how, uh, how frustrating that can be. Yeah. I try to wear a, a gray muted color of some kind. If I wear red, it's going to reflect into my painting. Or right. somebody wear white, it's going to reflect into my painting. Right. I still forget sometimes. I'll, you know, something will happen. I'll run out the door with my paints, and then uh, there I am in a white shirt, and I can't yeah. see anything. Well, just coat it with paint. <laughs> exactly. Hardly have anything that's not coated with paint. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> We had a, a cocktail party last night. We had uh, several hundred people on. We were just kind of talking about art. We had a lot of fun. That looked like a lot of fun. I really wanted to join, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to finish something up right now. So, Yeah, we all have excuses. <laughs> <laughs> so I do a lot of, uh, almost everything I do is an experiment. Rarely will I put down a stroke knowing full well <laughs> that it's going to work out. So on this one that I just put down, it's just too dark. It needs to be lighter. Um, I, I, wish, I wish I were the kind of artist who could just kind of have a game plan, stick to it, and get on with my life. But I'm constantly pushing color. I'm constantly pushing, um, you know, with color, I push it around the color wheel. I push the, uh, I push the saturation. Uh, you know, I push the value. Um, and uh, it's sort of like, what can I get away with? And this one right here just got a little too dark. Um, so I'm just trying to fix it. it it's amazing to me. I, I, uh, I have a hard time getting shadows light enough when I'm painting uh, sunlight. I mean, it, they're never, doesn't matter how light I make them, it almost seems, uh, they're never light enough. Well, especially when you, when you lay in the, the lights, it really amplifies the darks. Yeah. Or vice versa. you try to keep your shadows transparent? Is that important to you at Often all? Often I do. Sometimes when I'm out there just going for it, um, uh, kind of opacity just sort of happens <laughs> like here. So we'll see. I might actually remove some of this paint just so there's less of it. I might just stick with it. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, and you had asked about the surface. This is, um, this is a hardboard panel. It's a masonite panel I put. Uh, three coats of gesso on it. Uh, I put them on the back too. I love painting on panel because you can make it any size you want. And uh, if I, I'll probably wind up lopping the left inch and the right inch off of this painting. Um, I like that effect or, the, or that, you know, the ability to do that. You have to, uh, for people painting on masonite, you have to be really careful because masonite absorbs moisture. And so if you're, if you're going to leave any of it exposed, then you need to varnish it, but, or you need to do what he just suggested. And that is to gesso the whole thing. Otherwise the moisture will get in and over long periods of time, it'll crumble. Right. Yeah. So I gesso the sides and uh, I, I take pains to make sure that doesn't happen. do a lot of finger painting and palette knife painting. Yeah. 
that's why I wear gloves. I need to, I need to use my fingers, but I don't want that stuff going in my liver. <laughs> I usually do, but they don't look great on camera. So I'm not wearing them today. <laughs> You're so vain. <laughs> I mean, I spend most of my life covered in paint. So, you know, I, I allow myself a little bit of that. That's okay. We, we'll let, we'll let it go today. <laughs> A lot of very positive, very positive uh, comments. Oh, glad to hear that. Yeah. The virtual throwing of tomatoes is something that I was hoping to avoid. Yeah, nobody's allowed to throw tomatoes here. They, they, we immediately, we immediately uh, execute them. It is amazing what a positive community you have created and sort of the social media, which um, I got into 100% because you gave a speech in San Antonio about 12 years ago and basically said, all of you introverts need to get on this because you need it for your careers. And I just switched my thinking right after that and, um, and embraced it. But it's amazing how positive everybody is. I hear so many people who are not artists complaining about the negativity. And I just think to myself, it's great that well, there's this sense that we're all kind of in this together. Well, that's why I did it is, is I, I, you know, I noticed that my team members, my wife, my kids, everybody was starting to go negative. And, um, uh, I just thought, and, and my friends. And so I thought if I can just do something to keep people occupied and upbeat a little bit, get our community together. And, and I thought this was going to last two weeks. I think we all did. Right. Um, uh, you know, and here we are 338 days into it. That's why I need a vacation. <laughs> Hey, I see somebody from Bee Cave, Texas. I'm in Bee Cave, Texas. How exciting. I'm actually, uh, it's, out, it's right outside of Austin. So you were at the San Antonio, that would have been the uh, the gallery, the Greenhouse Gallery talk. That's today. right. I was with Greenhouse for a few years and uh, I love I miss them. I do too. They were great guys. There were so many great artists in there. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was, it, it was a speech that really changed the way I looked at everything. I'd always sort of, you know, looked down. I mean, this is 2009 maybe, um, but I'd always sort of, I didn't want any part of social media. And you just said, Hey, look, you guys need to get over it. I think you might've used that word, uh, those words. And you said, this is free advertising. You need to embrace this. And I really changed the way I looked at everything. Well, I'm glad to have helped. If you want to send a commission check, I'd be happy to take it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's in the mail. Just look for it. <laughs> oh, the three great lies. <laughs> we won't talk about the other two. Uh, funny. So normally, um, normally, I don't really have a normally uh, for the way that I work. Sometimes I'll block in the whole thing. Sometimes I'll uh, kind of start in the most important area. Occasionally I'll work from back to front, which is something that I encourage my, um, my students to do. But um, the, the going out and getting information from life, I really think is important. And if I can paint the whole painting from life, I'll do it. Um, in fact, this one, I'll probably just go back because I can paint this from life. I can, I'm not allowed to be out of the house from 7 to 8 p.m. Um, but I can paint this in the late afternoon. So I might just go finish this from life. Um, but if not, it's really helpful to just get these colors down because the colors don't look anything like the photo and, um, and neither does the depth or the overall feel of, uh, of the scene. So, um, I encourage my cityscape students, you know, a lot of them will have a, a photo they took in Italy and you can't get back to Italy right now for a, you're not going to go over there for a 20 minute color study, but if you're looking West, when the sun is setting in Italy, well, you know, some of those colors might be the same as when you're looking west and the sun is setting um, in Texas or in Virginia. Yeah. So yep. um, I think it's really important to keep learning while painting, never to sort of get into that thing where you're not learning anything from the painting you're doing. Now, you're painting in oils, uh, I assume. That's right. Yeah, somebody asked in the, in the questions. If you guys have questions, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass them along. Um, you at Vicky asked, where are you painting from? Uh, I'm painting from McLean, Virginia, which is right outside of Washington, DC. All this right. is an area of DC called Georgetown. And it's a place I've spent a ton of time as a kid, as an adult. 
And uh, it's an area of town that I really um, have a connection to. And uh, so I've had my eye on this house for years. And this is a great opportunity to do it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. You know, architecture is a tough subject. It really is. I don't want to... I don't want to mess. I don't want to have an architect look at this and go, that wouldn't go like that. That thing wouldn't be there. It would be over there. So, um, but I, I, I love using it to sort of, I love history and I love the notion that we're kind of living in the society that our forebears built and um, living our very modern lives on top of these ancient foundations. So I'm really fascinated by um, depictions of architecture. The reason I think it's hard is is not just the perspective part, but you know, you you if you do everything that has perfect edges, like like you feel like you see, it just falls apart. You know, you have to find ways to break up lines and to keep it interesting, and uh, yet make it make it read like what you want it to read. So I, that's, a, that's a challenge for me. Oh, it's a huge challenge for me too, and um, not to get not to get too pretty with things. I mean, there's a reason why we paint, you know, rather than, I love digital art, I love photography, but um, I love those, you know, I love in the, in the song where you can hear the musician make a little mistake and they capture it on record. I mean, I love those elements of humanity um, and I want to bring those to my work, yeah. but I also want to get it right. So that's the dance. Somebody asked if you've ever painted a whole painting with a palette knife. Uh, I, I mean, maybe I have, I mean, maybe there have been, you know, a little bit of brushwork here and there, but I have painted entire paintings with palette knives and it's great. I love it. I love, I love the palette knife. All right. So we have, uh, we have a lot of people who I'm uh, recognizing might be new. I'm seeing names that I've not seen before. So if you're new, please go into the comments and say you're new. If you're watching and you're not in the comments, take a minute and say so. And if you're international, anywhere outside of outside of America, please say where you're from. Although everybody should say where they're from. It's nice to see where you're, you're coming in from. And remember, we have a, a prize, a digital subscription to Fine Art Connoisseur magazine, and you will love that magazine. I've been doing that for like 14 years. Such a great magazine. Joanne says, wow, I thought I recognized those buildings. Very familiar with Georgetown. I'm a native Washingtonian. Excellent. Okay. 31st and Q, Joanne. <laughs> How do you cut your masonite is one of the questions. I cut it with a handsaw. I mean, I cut it in the most old school possible way. Um, and uh, and then I, I sand down the edges. And uh, they usually go in frames anyway. So um, that's how I do it. Okay. Sand them down and then seal them. Right. I had uh, one summer, I had, uh, I, my studio used to be out on, on a, a enclosed porch in the Adirondacks. I've since moved, but uh, it, we had a patch of about three weeks of rain and I didn't go down to my studio and work much during that time for whatever reason. It probably was cold. And I went down there and all my panels were warped. Uh, I mean, seriously warped, like a half Ooh. circle warped. And um, the, uh, the I didn't have any masonite, but the, the birch panels had all curved. And uh, so I at that point, I stopped... Uh, using that particular brand, but I, I also started trying to seal things because if they'd been sealed, they wouldn't have absorbed the, the moisture in the air. Right. Now, will you eventually try to create the essence of bricks? I mean, would you actually put brick lines in there or will you just, you just want the mind to fill in the blanks? Um, now, I can't really see the bricks in these areas. In these areas, I can a little bit. So I'm gonna, the, the way that um, I kind of push things is gently. You know, you you tip your foot, your toe in the pool and then your ankle and then your knee. So I'll, 
probably create a sense of texture in these bricks along the transitions where, you know, we see that the most. Okay. And if that works, maybe I'll, I'll expand it across and at a certain point I'll go too far and that's when I'll probably stop. Uh, Gerda in uh, Netherlands would like to know the color of the roof. It's kind of a cross between gold and green. Um, it's, uh, the local color of it seems to be a very, 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 very light gray. Um, a very warm gray. But what did you use to paint it? Oh, okay. Um, so my palette is the cadmium colors, uh, um, the loser and crimson, uh, permanent rose, cadmium red, cadmium red light, cadmium orange, uh, cadmium yellow light, <laughs> um, chromium oxide green, phthalo green. So it's a combination of those colors um, and a little back and forth, basically between gold and between green. And that actually reminds me, this, this highlight's showing up a little more uh, uh, sort of um, sharply than uh, it probably looks in real life. But I, I'm going to put a kind of right. pinkish over there. Because of the camera, yeah. Yeah, it's got a little, it, it's looking a little bit too orange to me. So I'm going to throw a little bit of red on top. And that's something that I do a lot is just, you know, if a color veer is too orange, I'll bring it back with some red. If a color, you know, if a blue is getting too green, I'll throw a purple in there um, rather than obscuring it all together. So let's, well, let's try this out. Nope, too dark. Too dark. Okay. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> well, that's, at least you didn't cover the whole thing. That's why you want to put test spots down. Yeah. And I don't want to completely obscure that that gold. I want them to kind of play together. And that's too light. Goodness gracious. And it's also too pink. Um, so I'll sneak it back to orange, towards orange, and make it a little bit darker. And those are the decisions that you know, we're just always making with color, you know, hue, saturation, and value. And we're constantly just shifting those levers and seeing what works and what doesn't. There we go. That's the color that I want. And now that's you know, the pink has sort of completely taken over that. So I'm going to put some of that gold back up there on top. And that's right. something that I do a lot is just, um... yeah, there we go. All right. It's getting a little monolithic. Well, you got a big international audience. I'm not reading the names anymore because I've offended some people by doing that, but uh, they don't want me interrupting. But I am putting them on the screen from time to time. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. You're internationally famous. You're pulling them in from everywhere. I love it. Well, thanks, Eric. This is really fun, and I, I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this and uh, how much I'm enjoying it. So it's great to, to uh, see everybody, so to speak. Yeah. You're doing a great job. You're knocking it out of the park. Thank you. That really means a lot. I used to paint from back to front because when I started, I hadn't, I never painted really a landscape before I was about 30. I always wanted to be Frederick Church, so I would try. I'd go out and I'd come in with you know 19 finished leaves and a whole bunch of white area. But um, when I started painting landscapes, I figured I would paint from back to front because it looked to me like that's what he did. And after a while, it occurred to me that that was kind of forcing me to give everything the same amount of attention, you know, to make, in a sense, put the same amount of detail into the background as the foreground. And into the less important areas is the most important areas. So um, then I shifted my thinking, and I don't paint this way formulaically, but I'll often paint from most important to least important in one way or another. Um, so in a sense, that's kind of what I'm doing here. Well, and you think about it, if you do that, yeah, I mean, you captured the light uh, before the light changed. Yeah. And so if, and, and that it's that turret that probably got you excited about that building. Mm -hmm. and so I, I kind of like that too. I've been told by some artists, that's what they do is they, they try to get the thing in that they're most interested about because after you get fatigued after an hour or two, you know, you start making mistakes and 
And the reality is that everything else kind of becomes secondary or tertiary anyway. Yeah. And actually, that's something a lot of people ask me questions about. How do you paint landscapes when the sun's always moving and the shadows are always moving? And I encourage them to think of that as the best part about painting landscapes because you get to cherry pick. You go, oh, hey, that turret just came into sunlight. I'll keep that. And oh, well, that's turning into shadow. I don't really like that so much, but maybe it'll be sunlight later. And then, gosh, this is a mess down here. Oh, look, now that just turned into shadow. OK, I'll take that. And to look at it as an opportunity, just kind of take what you want and, um, and you know, if, kind of leave the rest alone. One thing I like to do, uh, I don't do it as often as I should, but I like to keep a couple of, uh, you know, like a, a secondary canvas with a couple of small areas, um, you know, blocked out, taped out. And if I see something that changes, even though I don't necessarily want to mess with the composition I've got, I want to capture it. I'll do a quick sketch, oil sketch in a, you know, in a little thumbnail that's, you know, the size of a credit card. And that way I can use that later if I'm doing a studio piece or want to change something up. Yeah, that's a really nice approach. And you wind up with all of these kind of notes in your studio, like, oh, okay, that's, you know, that's cool backlighting on these trees. I'll need that one day, you know, I'll take that. Uh, someone is asking what kind of brand of paint you're using. Uh, I'm using um, uh, Jack Richardson paints. They make great paints. They do and, make great paints, and they're really cheap. Yeah, they do a great job, and uh, their brushes are great, and their paints are great, and that's what I'm using. You know, he had uh, he 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 had tubes of paint at the plein air convention. All the vendors always bring in great stuff and great discounts, and. He was selling tubes of paint for five bucks, I think. And yeah, it's really amazing. They actually make the, the local art supply store here um, is Plaza. They actually make the Plaza brand paint. So the you know the they're they're richest in paints, but they've got the Plaza uh, label on them, and as such, they're less expensive. Um, they're great paints. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of uh, I I don't know a lot, but there are some some brands that are all made by one in one factory with the same process. Yeah, that's something that um, that I still have a lot to learn about. But uh, it's, it's we fun. all have a lot to learn. If you guys are enjoying this, please make sure you share it so others can enjoy it and uh, maybe hit a like or a thumbs up button. Nothing helps more than to have you share it. And, and, and if you're in another country as well, because if you're an artist like Shubaha in India, if she's an artist and she knows lots of other artists on her social media, they're going to find this and then they'll get the pleasure of tuning in every day. Thank you for watching. Yeah, thank you for watching. Let me just show you kind of how I go about things. So this neutral in there, I wasn't really sure. Put this down. This is about the color of the, um, the road. It's too dark and it's too green. Now I do a lot of removing paint. I, um, I leave a trail of Q-tips everywhere I go. Q-tips are great for removing, but um, I really enjoy just going, okay, if that's too dark and too green, I'm going to make it lighter and redder and uh, we'll see how that goes. So I'll just take some, I'll take, I'm going to go aggressive. I, uh, I encourage people to be aggressive with color in the beginning. You can always make it duller. You know, if you go too saturated, you can always make it duller. If you go too dull in the beginning, it's tough to paint into that yeah. and uh, get it really vibrant. So I'll just throw a permanent rose in here. Now I find this very, very important. I'm going to keep my eye on this. I'm going to put this in, in with my peripheral vision, and I'm going to take note of whether it makes my painting better or worse. One of two things is going to happen. My painting is either going to get better or it's going to get worse when I put this aggressive hot pink in here. So eyes focused on this. Let's see here. I can live with that. I can live with that for now. A lot of times it's a disaster, but I can live with that for now. So I guess that means better. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I'm assuming you'll tell me if I'm wrong. Oh yeah, you you sh you you can be assured of that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm like I'm some expert. I'm not.
Okay, question. Has anyone ever visited the Torpedo Factory in Old Alexandra in Northern Virginia? Three-story building of art studios and galleries on the water. Amazing. Oh, yeah, uh, it's a great spot. It's one of the top tourist destinations in D.C. I mean, it's up there with the Air and Space Museum and the National Gallery. Really? Oh, yeah. I'm coming. It's got 300 artist studios. It's a great place. They teach classes there. It's a great place. All right. Maybe I'll come. Oh, now you'll come. <clears throat> well, I always need an excuse. <laughs> torpedo factory. Cool. Yeah, it was a torpedo factory in World War II. It's a neat place. Well, was it really? Yeah. So when we went to, uh, I took a group to Cuba two different times. There's a giant uh, metal building or I don't on the water. And it must have a thousand artist stalls in it. And oh, wow. it's absolutely amazing. I mean, every, everything you can think of from people who hand make things to things made in China, some of it's kind of garbagey, but some really, really phenomenal art. And they have a hard time getting art supplies there. So I don't know how they pull it off. Oh, wow. But I saw some artists there. I bought some art there that was every bit as good as anything I've ever seen. It must be fascinating with the culture they have there and the politics to see what those Cuban artists are making. Well, they have nothing. I mean, they just really do without. Okay, people are asking me to have you produce a video with us. Oh, my gosh. I would love to. All right. Done. Next. <laughs> Whoever asked that question, thank you very much. Shoot me your address and, um, you know, I'll send you a thank you. <laughs> when we see somebody great like you, we like to amplify that. Well, that means a great deal to me coming from you. So thank you for saying that. You do a lot of teaching, uh, locally or did you i do i've always taught portrait and figure um at a, at a great art center called the yellow barn and um since I, I love teaching portrait and figure those are the that's the way that i became an artist is that uh i didn't go to art school i took classes for years with um with robert liberace and danny dawson yeah and um uh, it, it was such a great experience that I've tried to, you know, I've tried to bring my own sensibilities to teaching. So I teach portrait and figure. And then since COVID started, I've started teaching um, cityscape painting. I, I, I never could figure out how I was going to make it work logistically. I mean, you just, it, you just can't deal with rainstorms and parking and bathrooms and people getting lost in that type of thing. Um, you know, downtown in DC, which is where I wanted to do it. Doing it in COVID. I mean, in, um, on uh you know through zoom and i'm really enjoying it i mean i can show frederick church's work and monet and hopper and uh, i can draw in photoshop it's really fun well, well robert liberace was at our uh face convention the figurative art convention and expo and uh the next one is due to be in your area your zone in williamsburg in november williamsburg is great yeah and uh, we have some of the top artists in the world coming in to teach. We don't know if we're going to be able to hold it, though. We hope so by November. Oh, uh, we, also, so. we also had a conference online, which we'll do again, which is called Realism Live, which focuses on uh, academic realism and impressionistic realism and everything in between. And um, we, of course, have uh, Plein Air Live uh, coming up. As a matter of fact, this Sunday is the last chance to register and get the best price. And then we had uh, Watercolor Live about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And uh, so we're, uh, we're doing a lot of virtual teaching, uh, three, four-day conferences with 40 or 30 or 40 of top artists, and we're having a ball doing it. And we may have something else up our sleeve that we haven't announced yet. We might. Just, just saying we might. might well, I'm might, excited to hear it. Might have had a logo approved for it today, so... We may be getting close. <laughs> Wonder what it is. Maybe the people will guess what it is in the comments.
that's it. You know, you've got a lot of beautiful subjects to paint around that area, especially when it comes to architecture. I love it. I love historical, uh, you know, cities with a historical feel, even just these buildings. My grandfather grew up in D.C. He, he you know, used to sell vegetables off a horse drawn cart before high school back in the 20s. And just looking at these buildings and thinking that he ran by them with his brothers. You know, he was definitely in this spot. His cousins lived down the street. You know, it's, it's just fascinating for me. It's a fascinating kind of exploration of humanity. You know, when uh, I, I love to photograph and paint old buildings that are crumbling. And, oh, really? you know, it's just I find it's fascinating. And, and uh, I always tell myself when I see them, even when I'm driving by them, I, I tell myself, you know, this was somebody's dream. You know, they may have saved their money their whole life to be able to build this. Uh, they may have gone to great trouble to build this. And, you know, here it is 50 years, 100 years, 200 years later, and it's crumbling. But it was once a dream. That'd be a great name for a painting. Crumbling. That'd be a good name for a show. Crumbling Dreams. That certainly is. Ooh, I like that. That's really catching the light. Yeah, I do a lot of putting down a color and then deliberately, you know, covering up 95% of it with another color. In this case, this just really warm orange um, is going to make the yellow that I put over top of it, hopefully, in theory, uh, just really glow. So, yeah, you're going to catch after up that build up, you know, we'll see. That reflected light. I often tell a story about. Uh, uh, I, I came out of the broadcast industry and I was in Boston. We were walking down the street and it was afternoon sun like that. And the light was splashing uh, the red brick building just like that. And the sky was glowing in pink. And I was with these broadcasters and I said, look over there, look at that light. Look at, look at how it's hitting the building. And they looked at me like I was Charles Manson or something like I, <laughs> like a, a tinfoil hat. It was just, they, they didn't, they said, I don't, we don't see it. What do you see? You know, so that's the value of becoming an artist is it really opens your eyes. It's really true. I often need to remind myself when I'm talking to people to be paying attention to what they're saying and not looking at the light on their, you know, on their face or the backlighting on their shoulder or whatever the situation may be. I would imagine some of our viewers have that same predicament. So it's fun to really lay this color on thick in these very oh, yeah. vibrant areas. Well, do you want to talk about the importance of thickness for catching light? Yeah, it's just, uh, for me, it's giving really giving something emphasis, you know, really building up the paint. I mean, not only giving it kind of a sculptural quality so it jumps out at you, it catches the light in the room more, um, and uh, it's very noticeable, but also in terms of... Um, uh, saturation and kind of luminosity. Um, you know, the, all of this paint is to a certain degree um, uh, translucent. And so if you can really, you know, I'll, I'll lay on a really warm, very saturated color underneath and then put a lighter, you know, by definition, less saturated color on top, um, rather than just putting that second color down on top of a gray canvas or down on a white canvas. And uh, it really makes the color sing. I mean, that, um, that kind of relief sculptural quality to paint is something I love and something that, again, um, I, I'm certainly not ever disparaging other forms of art. I, I love digital art. I love photography. I love film. I love everything. But there's something about the sculptural quality of paint that I, I think is just, you know, gives us so, such a great tool. I love all forms of art, some better than others, but I, you know, I, I get excited about some things that I don't think I would, you know, once in a while I'll see a, you know, completely wild piece that just blows me out of the water. That is not anything I would, would think that I would love, but I respond emotionally to it. Isn't that a great feeling? You know, if you're, 
you know, I'm not somebody who spends a ton of time paying attention to, you know, what we consider to be abstract art. But Would, when I see something that really grabs me, you know, or makes me question and go, how in the world did this person do this? It's such a great feeling. What are you painting with? It looks like you have two brushes taped together. Yeah, I have a really small brush, um, which has the perfect point. Uh, I think it's a size, I want to say it's a size one uh, gray matters brush, but um, it's too short. I, I like a long brush. So I duct taped it to this other brush that has, you know, <laughs> it's seen its day in the sun. And okay. now it's nice and long. All right. Yeah, I'd be lost without duct tape. Duct tape, uh, duct tape and Q-tips. We literally needed duct tape this week. We had a plumber here, and he went up to fix our plumbing, and he stepped on our ducts and destroyed our ducts, and we had to have somebody come in. Uh, Lori and I are up there trying to keep the heat coming in the house. It's, you know, it's seven degrees, and we got the duct tape out, and we duct taped it on the ducts. First time I've ever done that. <laughs> it comes in handy. That's right. How is everything down there? My brother lives in Austin. And, oh, he uh, does. Well, you'll have, yeah, we'll have I love to go. it out there. I love Austin. Uh, are you guys doing well? We'll have to go painting. Yeah, we're oh, fine. We're, we just have uh, three or four rooms destroyed and, and uh, water damage and pipe damage. And Oh, no. We had a horrible experience with Ben Franklin pl plumbers. I won't go into it, but I, I'm not going to recommend them again. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Promises made, and they called us today. We we had a we had a um, we were scheduled for them to come out, waiting five days, and uh, we had used them once before, and then they weren't coming. They weren't coming. We called them today, and uh, they said, "Oh, we decided not to come." We said, "Why?" And they said, "Well, because uh, you complained about our prices before, so we're not going to come." <laughs> so it's like, yeah, your prices were high. So, uh, but to, to do that, that is despicable, especially with what you're going through down there. We had another plumber. He had to, he had, he had to fix, a uh, one little tiny pipe. It probably took 10 minutes and he wanted $1,400 for it. I said, you're price gouging me. I'm not paying it. And if you don't charge me a reasonable price, I'm going to report you. So he did. Wow. So there's a lot of that going on down here right now, which is a shame. That is a shame. Okay, so I'd like to mention one thing that I'm doing right now. Um, we've probably all had that situation where you're out painting, you know, especially kind of in the beginning of our painting endeavors. I was really confounded by color. You know, Monet would put all those crazy colors everywhere, and I couldn't figure out how he could figure it out. Um, and I'd, I'd be sitting there trying to find those colors that my teachers were always yelling at me about. Uh, and I'd look up and I'd see, okay, that's red. So then I'd, I'd go to my palette and I'd mix a red and then I'd look up and it would look blue. I go, oh, it just looked red. What happened now it's blue? Um, maybe it is, maybe it's red and blue. Maybe it's a red brick. Maybe it's catching a last degree of sunlight. Maybe it, we're seeing a reflection of the blue sky. Uh, maybe we're seeing a bit of a reflection of the blue shadow over here. So put up some red. This is how I go about it. And then maybe I'll put up some blue. Um, this is a kind of grayish, purplish blue. Let's see what this looks like. And, and again, the way that I try to look at things, um, I try to make my decisions as binary as possible. This that I'm about to put up here is either going to make this painting better or worse. So let's figure it out. Again, eyes focused here. Mm, it's a little too dark. I'm going to yep. make it a little lighter and a little more crimsony. I'll add white and a bit of permanent rose to this. We'll see how that turns out. You know, that's a great tip I've never heard before is staring at the focal point and then asking if it makes it better or worse. Somebody ought to write that down. <laughs> I find um, it's very helpful. Sorry. I'll put that in my book. My, my new book that I'm going to take from all these broadcasts, I'm going to take all the tips and put them in a book. I love it. I find it's very helpful when drawing too. For instance, you know, if you're drawing a portrait, I mean, when I say drawing, you know, placing proportions um, for a portrait, if this is the person's nose and you're putting in their mouth, I find if you can put in the corner of their mouth with your peripheral vision and keep your eyes focused on their nose, uh, that can be really helpful.
Oh, Eric, I, uh, I, I ought to tell you that uh, my friends Nancy and everyone at uh, the Dreamline Artist Group on Facebook uh, said to say hello today. All right. Well, we, we, uh, we connected to a lot of folks last night on the cocktail party. A lot of new people, a lot of people that are not members of the Dreamline Artist Group, but um, love the Dreamliners. You guys are rock stars. Oh, that was nice. The way you just cut into that. The chimney here? Yeah, it's nice to see how other people do brush work. You know, that's that's really good. Yeah, that's, that's one of these things that's handy about um, this brush is that you can, you know, you can create these great sharp edges, but I'm using so much paint here. This is so thick, both the sky and the uh, chimney, that hopefully it's not going to get too, you know, too stiff and boring if the edges are all straight. But if it does get too stiff and boring, guess what? You know, now I got to fix that. I'm a big believer in kind of getting into trouble and forcing your yourself uh, to paint your way out of it. One of my teachers used to. Well, and you know, Richard black. Schmidt would leave it like that, you know, leave a little of that edge out there. Well, like he's, it. he's so great. I mean, I've learned so much from him. Well, now I'm all in my head about it. So <laughs> we'll see what the original, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see what the finished version winds up looking like. We're gonna uh, we're gonna end this in about three minutes. So if you want to okay. kind of finish up on that chimney, and then we'll come back on camera and get to everybody get to see your your face. Sounds great. Uh, somebody's asking a question about what the Dreamliners is. It's a group of people. Uh, it, it essentially what it was is I started talking about ending the broadcast after a couple of weeks and they thought they've been having fun getting together in the comments every day. So they started a group thinking I was going to stop this. And so anybody can be in the group. You just find dreamline artists on Facebook and apply to be a member. A lot of talented artists on there and, and some really nice people as well. Uh, Gavin's website is up on the screen. GavinGlakas.com, G-L-A-K-A-S.com. What will they find there? Oh, they'll find portraits. They'll find uh, cityscapes. They'll find information on classes, uh, links to galleries. Um, uh, but yeah, and, and a couple, you know, a couple of things about my story and uh, how I got here. So, when you come to Austin to see your brother, you come over and I'll show you the portrait collection. I've got. Uh, 26, 28, 30 portraits done by the greatest living artist of, of our time, uh, of me, of course, and uh, including some that are now deceased, uh, three that are deceased. And uh, it's pretty interesting to see. First off, my wife says, get them out of the house. Uh, <laughs> so I put them in my office. But if somebody comes in for a job interview, it's like, uh, sir, you've got a big ego. <laughs> But uh, it's nice to see how, first off, everybody interprets the same subject and also to watch the aging sequence. It's kind of like the opposite of the portrait of Dorian Gray. <laughs> <laughs> I love so many of those portraits. I've seen so many. And I think the first one I ever saw was Nelson Shanks's. Um, and uh, there's so many, so many really excellent ones. I spent uh, four days with Nelson painting me. Oh, my gosh. And uh, four half days. And the stories, just unbelievable stories. You know, he that. talking about, you know, his the things that Princess Diana told him in confidence and, you know, really cool. So she was dead at the time, so it was okay. But um, stories about painting Pavarotti and presidents. And, you know, it's really cool. That must have been great. It is amazing that the relationship that develops between portrait artist and sitter. Well, everyone's different, right? Some of them say, I, I don't want you to talk. Others say, please talk. Um, you know, cause that Nelson said, that's the, that's part of the experience is just getting to know people. Yeah. I try to remind myself that I need my sitters to talk because it's obviously easier <laughs> if you're sitting there painting and nobody's talking, but to get to know them, to get some animation in their face, to develop a neat relationship. Um, yeah. it, it's such an interesting uh, I dynamic. Do this, 
I do the same. I, I try to, you know, there are times that I'll say, okay, don't move your eyes or can you stop talking for a few minutes? But uh, yeah, I mean, I love doing that. Okay, we're going to put a cap on this. Uh, why don't you come back on camera? Everybody give Gavin applause. It's fabulous. Really nice to watch that develop. And uh, Gavin, uh, his, his website is on the screen again. So uh, that was terrific. Thank you're you. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, you're you're a good teacher. You're a good painter, and uh, and you've got a lot of variety. You know, the fact that you do you know landscapes and architecture and and uh, portraiture. We've had a really terrific time today. So thank you for doing this. I hope uh, hope we'll put something together on a video. I'll, I'll I would love that. I've that. really enjoyed this. Thank you, Eric, and thank you everybody for tuning in. And, uh, and uh, we'll figure out a way to get together and go painting. I'd love that. Thanks, All right. Sir. Thank you, Gavin. Well, our guest today was Gavin Glacus. Um, hang on for just a second. Don't go away. If you're new, especially, because uh, I want to just tell you something that's really important. We have, uh, uh, we normally have what we call the plein air convention. Uh, it's usually about 1,200 people, uh, people from all over the world, and we get together and we learn and we paint together. It's a lot of fun, but that's been canceled again this year, two years in a row. And this is how we eat. This is how we survive. And uh, also we're helping artists survive by putting together uh, a virtual conference called Plein Air Live. This will be the second one. We did the first in July. And this is like spring training for artists to get you tuned up and get you ready and painting your best before you go out. So if you can take three days and uh, if you can't, you can watch the replays after work or on your own leisure time. Uh, but if you can take three days concentrated effort, the learning is absolutely fabulous and uh, you'll get so much out of it. So uh, what I'd like you to do is to just check it out. Go to plenairlive.com and just know that uh, you can save $600 off the full retail price if you register by this Sunday. Uh, we've had uh, 50, 60, 70 people registering a day, uh, which is smart, trying to get in early and make sure you've got your seats. And because uh, we crashed the website uh, the last time this happened on the deadline day. And so that kind of messed everything up. So anyway... Uh, we have a terrific lineup, Bill Davidson, Camille Preswatic, Thomas Jefferson Kitts, Christine Lashley, Dave Santianis, Don Whitelaw, Don Demers, Stephen Queller, Deborah Joy Grosser. Uh, we, I mean, I, I could go on and on and on and on, and I should be mentioning them all. And there's more to be added, including uh, real soon, we're going to add uh, two more, three more rock stars that you're not even going to believe we got. Uh, I, I don't even believe we got. So hang on for that. Anyway, go to plenairlive.com and check that out. Also, I should mention that we have the SOAR workshop. Uh, the first one is going to be in March. Uh, we have both live and online. And SOAR is a new technology idea that we uh, decided to learn about learning and so that you can retain more. And so we're using those techniques in the workshop. The first one is Bill Davidson. The second is Thomas W. Schaller, and more will be announced. Uh, I want to mention that at the uh, Plen Air Live, we're going to do a Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, Joanna Arnett. And so you want to be there for that, too. We're also going to do the uh, Plen Air Salon Awards are going to take place on the Plen Air Live, since we can't do them live and in person. Today at 3 o'clock, we have a tutorial, Secrets of Painting Watercolor Outdoors with Andy Evenson. And you'll have a chance also to get a discount on his video online uh, or streaming or um, DVD. And so watch that today at 3 o'clock. Thank you guys for watching. And, uh, well, I'm going on vacation. woo <laughs> I'm very excited about that. And uh, I, I'm really going to miss you. This is going to be hard because I like showing up every day. But uh, uh, when uh, when uh, one of my uh, top people called me, he said, Eric, you're getting a little cranky. I thought, well, maybe I should go on a vacation. So uh, I need it. Uh, need to get down, see some family. And so uh, need to do some painting. And so I don't know if I'm even going to be on social media or not. I might. But what we're going to do is take uh, some of the best out of the last 338 days 
and we're going to replay them. And uh, we'll be, will we be giving away prizes every day? Yes, absolutely. So uh, tune in. If, and, you know, a lot of you tuned in late and, and did not see some of the early stuff. And so we've had some amazing things. We've had art marketing. We've had artists. All of the things that we have produced every day for 338 days, everything is on YouTube. And uh, you, the way to get access to anything we've produced, and, and there's, you know, hundreds of art demos and, and you know, lots and lots of stuff, uh, go to YouTube, search Streamline Art, and then uh, hit the subscribe button. The subscribe button is critical. And also, if you can, hit the notifications. That way you'll get notified when something new gets posted. But uh, if you've been tuning in from around the world and you didn't see the first few days or the first 100 days or the first 200 days or the first 300, there, you know, there, uh, there's a, a, a full art school uh, in this. I mean, this is, this is uh, lots of different variety, different styles of art, different approaches. Everybody's different. You can learn something from every single day. And uh, if you have time to occupy, that'll be a really terrific thing. Uh, when I get back, uh, we're going to soon after we're going to celebrate 350 days. And then uh, soon after that, we're going to celebrate one year. Uh, I'm going to figure out some fun things to do for those celebrations. And so you want to be here and I hope you'll tune in. If you can't tune in, watch the replays. Uh, we have had uh, so many people sharing this. It's really great because we've had, I, I looked on YouTube. I think we've had 6 million views. I mean, it's just incredible. And uh, it's just really something that's changing the art world because people are becoming one and becoming a community. And uh, we love that. I mean, that, that just, uh, last night I was in tears. I should tell you, I didn't, I didn't show my tears much. I was kind of trying to hide it, but I, uh, we had a little girl who was on the last cocktail party with her mom and she sold me a painting for $4 and so I sent her the money and the painting hasn't arrived yet. So she asked me if my painting had arrived yet, which I hadn't seen. I think it's in my stack of mail. Anyway, she said, by the way, I have another painting. And so I pulled it out and I, we did an auction and we sold her painting for $25 or 20, $24 or $25. And she just lit up like a firecracker. And then her sister's there. And she said, well, I have a painting too. And so we auctioned her sisters. Her sister's a little older. So we made sure she got a dollar more. And so we had a lot of you bidding on it. We had a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, that does my heart good. You know, when, when you share what you have learned with someone else and watch their eyes and watch how their their body changes and their body language changes when they realize that they can paint. It's see, it's up to you. It's not up to me. Uh, I'm just a messenger here. And and if you can, uh, if if you can teach somebody to paint, if you can show them the way, everybody, uh, you're you're going to encounter people all the time. People walk up to me when I'm outdoors painting, and they always say the same thing. I wish I could do that, but I don't have any talent. I can't even draw a stick figure, right? They always say the same thing. And they oftentimes say, well, you know, my aunt was a painter or my uncle was a painter. And I'll say, if you want to do this, you can do this. Let me show you how right now. And I'll actually give them a lesson right there on my painting. I'll have them pick up the brush. I'll show them a couple of things. That's just enough to make them understand they can do it. And uh, to, to just tell people, look, you can do this, that it's a mental barrier. We think that, you know, we, we don't believe that heart surgeons can do it naturally. We know we believe they have to go through training. We don't believe that musicians can just sit down and play something naturally. We know they have to learn their scales and go through training. But for some reason, we believe that artists just have this instinct. Well, it's just very rarely true. Most of the artists out there have learned because they've train themselves. And yeah, it's not easy, but who cares? Anything good in life isn't easy. And it's just a matter of learning a process and a system. So if you're watching and you don't think you can do it, you can do it. I have free lessons at paintbynote.com. It's kind of like paint by number, but it's paint by note, like a music note, paintbynote.com. And that's where I teach you the very basic foundations of values, because if you nail that, Color makes it harder, but if you nail values first, then color isn't as hard. So go there or tell your friends about it. It's paintbynote.com. Thank you for being here today. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sad. I'm going. 
but I'm happy I'm going and I'll be back and, and uh, be well rested and ready to conquer this for however long we need to keep going. And you know, who knows, maybe we'll go longer after that. This is fun to do. So have a terrific day. Thanks again to Gavin Glacus. Make sure you visit his website. And uh, he did a terrific job. Thanks again. Have a terrific day. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Pick those up at the newsstand. All right. Bye.